Welcome to the 2020 Global Shifts Colloquium at Perry World House, the University of Pennsylvania's global public policy hub. Thank you all so much for being here today. We are excited to be conducting our first ever virtual colloquium and thrilled that so many of you have tuned in from around the world. I hope everyone is safe and healthy in these unprecedented times. My name is Michael Horowitz, a Richard Perry Professor and the Director of Perry World House here at the University of Pennsylvania. Before I do my formal introduction, a couple of notes. First, following the keynote remarks and conversation, we will open the discussion up to questions that have been received from the audience. Two, to ask a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom interface in the middle. Three, you will also see a chat button. Please save this for any technical issues. Four, please keep things clean and safe for work in the chat and the Q&A, which will help us have a successful event. Our 2020 Global Shifts Colloquium has brought together academics and policymakers from all over the world for days of conversations on climate change and climate-induced human displacement. We've been honored to have several distinguished speakers with us and to, and to, to conclude the colloquium, we're especially honored to have the Dean of the University of Pennsylvania's Weizmann School of Design, Fritz Steiner, join us. Dean Steiner is also the Pali Professor and Co-Executive Director of the McCarg Center at Penn. He's taught all over the United States, in Beijing, and was also a Fulbright Hayes Scholar in the Netherlands, one of the intellectual vanguards of climate adaptation in response to sea level rise. He's a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects and the Council of Educators in Landscape Architecture and a scholar at the Penn Institute for Urban Research, one of Perry Worldhouse's key partners in all of our global shifts work related to this colloquium. Dean Steiner helped establish the Sustainable Sites Initiative, the first of its kind to offer a systematic comprehensive rating system designed to define sustainable land development and management. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Dean Steiner. Thank you, Mike. And it's an honor to be here to uh, introduce two uh, uh, very esteemed uh, individuals. And it continues our um, interaction with the Perry World House, uh, but also with uh, the United Nations around climate. Uh, two of our faculty have been uh, particularly uh, involved in the UNFF FCCC COP uh, conferences, um, including uh, Jeannie Birch, who is the uh, director of the Penn, a co director of the Penn Institute of uh, Urban Research, as well as a member of the city and re regional planning faculty, and Mark Allen Hughes, the director of our Kleinman Center for Energy Policy. Um, both of them have been um, involved in several of the UN COPs, including last year in Madrid. And I also, uh, we're working with uh, friends and colleagues in Glasgow to mount uh, three exhibits with our colleagues in Glasgow next, uh, in November 2021 uh, for the next COP uh, conference. Uh, it's a real honor to introduce Patricia Espinosa. Ms. Espinosa took office as the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change on uh, the 18th of July in 2016. She's an ambassador uh, of Mexico to Germany since 2012, as well as from 20, uh, 2001 to 2002. She is a tireless supporter of multilateralism as a way to improve conditions for the development of all regions in the world. Understanding the, in, the, the, the really tight link between the aims of the Paris Climate Agreement and, and the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, in addition to her service in, from uh, Mexico and Germany, uh, she was also the previous ambassador uh, from Mexico to Austria, Slovakia, Slovenia, and uh, the UN uh, organizations in Vienna. Uh, after uh, Ambassador uh, Espinosa's keynote uh, remarks, we have the great honor to be joined by the esteemed Lisa Friedman, reporter for the New York Times on climate, at the Climate Desk. She's focusing on climate and environmental policy in Washington. I'm a big fan, Lisa. Uh, looking forward. Uh, and Lisa will then uh, moderate a uh, discussion after uh, Ambassador um, Espinosa's keynote, keynote remarks. So it's my great uh, honor to uh, turn the screen over to uh, Ambassador Patricia uh, Espinosa. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dean Steiner, for that very generous um, introduction. Lisa, it's uh, also a pleasure to have uh, a conversation with you today. And, and thank you, Mike. Thank you for the invitation to join you. Um, dear friends, greetings from Bonn, Germany. Of course, I would rather be with you in person, but we all understand why we meet in this way. This is a difficult year for people everywhere and especially for students and faculty. So the first thing I want to do is to send you my best wishes for your health as well as for your families and friends. While I sympathize with you, I also admire your perseverance. We will get through this. Perseverance, dedication, commitment to a common purpose. These are the golden threads that have guided humanity through history's maze, through empires constructed and fallen, disasters man-made and natural, through personal toil and the turmoil of nations to the present. We are once again offered this lifeline as we face our most immediate threat, COVID-19, as well as the existential threat of climate change. In difficult times, it's easy to forget the milestones that matter. It's easy to think division is all we ever had when it is so far from the truth. The truth is that we are in a strong place to address our current challenges due to the daily and decades long work of institutions such as the University of Pennsylvania. On April 22nd, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. The late University of Pennsylvania Professor Emeritus Ian McCarg was one of the founders of Earth Day, which raised awareness of the need for environmental sustainability in a changing world. It's now a major event in the global calendar. This April, the University of Pennsylvania signed a power purchase agreement for the construction of two new solar energy facilities in central Pennsylvania to supply campus with renewable energy. This will power 75% of the university, including one of the largest medical complexes in the world. The university has also dedicated itself to the green recovery, led by the McCart Center and others, Green recovery is essential for our health, our economies, and to conserve nature, which supports us all. It's also encouraging to learn about ongoing work to help people better understand the links between climate change and biodiversity loss, including the restoration of biodiversity hotspots in the Galapagos Islands. As we open media apps filled with news of despair, let us not forget that you, along with millions of others throughout the world, are dedicated to building a clean, green, healthy, sustainable, and just planet. We need this dedication, this common purpose, now more than ever. Ladies and gentlemen, this decade will determine the fate of humanity with respect to climate change. If we don't act now, and not just governments, but all of us, it will be too late. Some people compare climate change to a slow moving hurricane that is brewing in the distance, threatening our shores. With all due respect, stop it with that metaphor. The hurricane is literally already here. There are so many hurricanes this year in the southern United States that meteorologists have nearly exhausted the letters of the alphabet used to name them. At one point, there were five happening simultaneously, with a sixth developing over the Atlantic. Speaking of records, the devastating fires on your west coast are destroying land and lives. More than five million acres burned, a record for California, Oregon, and Washington. The smoke is horrific for those living in those states and it has spread throughout the country. Nor can we forget Death Valley, which set an all-time heat record, 29.9 degrees Fahrenheit, 54.4 Celsius. 
This is not a trend. This is not a blip. This is not seasonal. This is climate change and it's going to get worse if we don't get our collective acts together, domestically and internationally. Climate change does not wait on electoral cycles. It does not care about whether you're right wing, left wing or center. It does not respect who is president, prime minister, whether you were born in this generation or the last, whether what your race is, who you pray to or how much money you make. It's coming all the same, it's here. The science of climate change is absolutely crystal clear. There is no debate. That debate was over three decades ago. A well-funded fog of misinformation may line a few pockets, but it does not alter reality. Climate deniers don't want your trust. They want your money. The rest of us want a better future for all people a future that respects the inherent balance between national sovereignty and the need to harness multilateralism to solve the world's common challenges. If COVID-19 has taught us one thing, it's how essential government commitment and institutions are at all levels with respect to recognizing, mobilizing, and responding to an emergency. While we cannot compare this pandemic with the climate change emergency, they are not the same thing. The need for a united multilateral response is something both crises share. At UN Climate Change, we understand this need and are working to bring nations together to address climate change through the Paris Agreement and the UN's 2030 Agenda. While we provide the framework for action on climate change, these actions are the responsibility of nations themselves. We are not a legislating body. Right now, nations are behind in their work, especially with respect to submitting their national climate action plans under the Paris Agreement. Those plans, pandemic or not, are still due in 2020. They're crucial because they're submitted only once every five years. By the next time these plans are due, that window will likely be closed. But that's not all nations need to do. And with that, I'd like to turn to three essential ingredients I feel are needed to fully unleash the power of the Paris Agreement. First, governments must significantly and immediately boost their climate change ambition and be accountable for meeting their pledges. We must slash emissions as soon as possible, 45% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. There is no separate path. There is no alternative universe. This is what we must do. Ambition on this front is crucial, but so is the need for climate ambition in specific areas such as mitigation, adaptation, and means of implementation, including finance. Governments are not solely responsible for this work. Businesses throughout the world must align their goals with the Paris Agreement. Simply put, business as usual is an investment plan in failure over the long term. Those who don't take steps now to align their work with global climate change goals will soon be out of business. One of the slivers of optimism throughout this pandemic is the national leaders and businesses map out their post-COVID-19 recovery plans and use this opportunity to truly spur innovative and transformative change. We hear about building back better, but I suggest we must build forward. This means enacting policies that promote green growth, protect biodiversity, embrace renewable energy, and more. It means a deep transformation must take place in all facets of life and how we live it, including in transportation, construction, production, supply chains, our relationship with the natural world, and much more. Again, the essential blueprints to protect people and planet already exist. 
the 2015 Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda. What we need is to complete the work remaining under each and continually increase ambition. The second essential ingredient is to plan for a resilient future. A few months ago, UN Secretary General Guterres told us that these are dark days, but not days without hope. We cannot lose that hope. Let's remember that in the last five decades, humanity has collectively made significant progress on some of its greatest challenges, including slashing extreme poverty, eradicating major diseases, boosting vaccination levels, improving access to education for women and children, and more. We are also reminded of successful and ongoing global efforts to repair the ozone layer. When we are willing, our capacity for positive change is infinite. But this won't come overnight. In each of these advancements, we had to clearly state the goal and then get to work developing the plans and policies, strengthening logistics and legislation to reach them. Never was the path easy, nor will ours be. Progress means making tough choices, and ours is significant if we truly want economic and social recovery from COVID-19 to reflect our urgent and collective need to build a more resilient and sustainable future. A true green recovery means investing in the deep transformational and transparent changes needed to build a, non, a more sustainable climate-friendly future. Changes that encompass every sector, industry, business, and jurisdictional structure throughout the world. Clean energy must be at the heart of that recovery. UN Secretary General Guterres has clearly stated that coal has no place in COVID-19 recovery plans. In this, the fossil fuel industry has an important role to play. This means phasing out coal as soon as possible and other industries to make the transition to more sustainable energy production as rapidly as possible. With respect to the oil and gas industry, we need to see ambitious plans for increased cooperation amongst themselves, as well as cooperation on climate-related disclosures and to stop financing campaigns and lobbying activities on behalf of fossil fuels. And yet, to build resilient future, Mitigation is not enough. The climate emergency is already here and people are already suffering. It's not about giving up, it's about facing reality. That's why we must see strong adaptation strategies, strategies that enable effective recovery from environmental hazards and build long-term resilience to those hazards in the first place. The third essential ingredient for success is a just transition. Because climate change impacts all of us, we must put our divisions aside and work together to address it. We must also learn the lessons of history. We cannot repeat the same old story we've seen many times in the past when great transition and change have resulted in people and entire nations falling by the wayside. We must therefore ensure the transformation to move to more renewable future is a just transition. What does that mean? It means governments establishing the programs and policies that will help people make a transition to new industries. Jobs related to renewable energy are growing exponentially, but if people don't have the skills to work in those areas, we'll have big problems. We want the age of renewable energy to improve the lives of workers, not end their livelihoods. Boosting ambition, building a more resilient future, and providing a just transition. Just those are the key elements we need to unleash the power of the Paris Agreement and build a cleaner, greener, and healthier future. But how do we get there? One word, multilateralism. We like to say that climate change begins with one person working hard individually. That's true. 
but it cannot stop there. One person cannot do it alone, nor can one city alone or one nation alone. Climate change requires all sectors of society from all nations working together towards, as we said at the beginning, a common purpose. This is the same for climate change as it is for COVID-19 or other big challenges humanity is facing. We've gone further at UN Climate Change and have adopted what we call inclusive multilateralism. This means ensuring all sectors of society are involved in discussions on tackling any global challenge. And that includes you. I cited some of the University of Pennsylvania's work earlier, but I also invite you to do even more to harness your resources and contribute the knowledge that will help countries and people massively boost their ambition, as well as helping them to adapt to climate change and build resilience. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, any study of human history reveals our complex, conflicted, and often contradictory tendencies. Yet it also reveals our care, compassion, and commitment to the common goal. The fact is that we can achieve incredible success over seemingly impossible odds. We've done it before and we'll do it again. We are, for example, encouraged by the incredible work of scientists working towards a vaccine for COVID-19. And we are encouraged by the youth and all others who have been making their voices heard on the streets, online and in the media about climate change. But here's the big difference between climate change and COVID-19. We did not see the pandemic coming. It hit us hard and without warning. Climate change is another matter. We've been long warned of its consequences, long warned of its growing danger. The only question is, will we respond in time? Will we treat it as the emergency it is? We must, but we are running out of time. We must follow the thread of perseverance, dedication and commitment to achieve our common goals. That thread, bound by wisdom, strengthened by experience, has guided humanity through its hardest times and will do so again. But we must want it. We must plan and execute it. I look forward to working with you to achieve it. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you so much, Executive Secretary Espinoza. Um, my name is Lisa Friedman. I have the honor of, of leading us in some questions, but I'm going to leave plenty of time for audience questions because I know from experience that the events like this that the audience always has often much better questions than the moderator. Uh, I just first want to address my photo that you're seeing. Apparently I'm having some Wi-Fi issues on, on my end so uh, you may from time to time get my glamour shot instead of... <laughs> um, <laughs> That was a really, you know, a wonderful address. You look and, great, and Lisa. You look great. <laughs> We're all doing our best from home these days. <laughs> um, I think what you said about, you know, pandemic or not, you know, nations have have work to do. Um, let Let's start there. What are you seeing from countries right now on the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions that they are expected to to bring by COP26. Um, you know, are you hearing from nations? We just we we can't do it right now. We've got so many challenges because of coronavirus and and the economic strain that's being being put on us. Are countries telling you that we just can't raise ambition right now because of that? Well, I have to say that uh, the, what we have, uh, what we are hearing is actually a continued commitment to present the NDCs. Uh, nobody, we, I haven't heard uh, of, of, of really countries saying, no, we will not do it. Uh, we have heard, yes, 
uh, at the beginning of the year, we were trying to follow up and trying to look at what, when is the time where countries are intending to come up with the NDCs, because we are also working with other UN entities in order to try to support them in putting together those new or updated NDCs like UNDP and uh, UNEP. Um, uh, at the beginning of the year, let's say what we what we had was, you know, a bigger group of countries that intended to present their NDCs, like around this time. Um, that has changed, and many have clearly said, well, you know, uh, everything has been slow, slowed down uh, at home, but we continue to work. So what we are seeing really is a continuous commitment uh, to work and present the NDCs and to show that um, the governments are taking these commitments really seriously. Uh, so I, I am, this, this is of course encouraging. It's not, it doesn't mean that we are there and things are, are fine as you, as you just heard. My, my message, my main, mes main message continues to be we need more ambition, we need uh, uh, to um, increase the speed at which we are moving, um, but uh, at least what we are seeing is not, you know, people turning their, their, their uh, back to the process. How many countries do you believe will submit updated NDCs by the end of this year? Well, it's difficult to say. From our um, informal uh, contacts, I, I would expect that we should be um, achieving um, uh, maybe between 80, 100. Um, but of course, you know, we also understand that the, the current conditions are in fact slowing down some of the internal processes. NDCs, putting together NDCs means really working across government structures and in many cases also working with different levels of government. So that's not, uh, having been in government, I understand the challenges that that poses. Uh, but still, uh, you know, our role uh, and our strong message is to remind everyone that the, the, the deadline that was established uh, in 2020 has not changed. And I mean, this is such a complicated COP coming up because for, for so many reasons related to the pandemic. How, how many uh, uh, countries raising ambition do we need to make COP26 a success? And, and you know, related to that, how do you judge success for this upcoming COP, UNFCCC conference? Well, you know, um, uh, if we if we are um, uh, if we understand uh, success as uh, you know a moment where the international community gives a clear signal that we are advancing and that the, there is a willingness to continue to work towards achieving the goals that have been established in the Paris Agreement, even if we are not yet clearly there. I think uh, that that means putting together many different elements. There is not one single thing that you would say, okay, that is going to be, uh, to make the difference between success or lack of success. Um, I think, of course, we have in our process still some important pending issues in the negotiations, so that needs to be addressed. I, I really, really hope, and uh, we, will, we will need really political level decision making also intervening in order to allow us to finalize the negotiations of the rules that will govern the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Um, but then beyond that, uh, as you say, of course, NDCs uh, will be one of the elements that, that will be critical. And, and, and here, um, of course, it, it has to, to have a combination of uh, countries that have really a, a bigger responsibility in reducing emissions, uh, the developed countries, uh, but also countries from the developing world. 
Uh, of course, uh, what we are seeing is, uh, for example, from countries that are the most vulnerable, like island countries, they are really coming, coming forward with very ambitious plans, like the Marshall Islands is uh, one example that I could, I could uh, refer to. But even beyond that, there are some uh, components that need to be present. I think that um, a clear signal that developing countries will have the support that is envisaged in the climate change regime for them to continue doing um, their uh, progress towards addressing climate change and raising their ambition that also needs to be needs to be present. Uh, one one very concrete example. Let me let me just um, uh, refer to this. In some um, uh, some small, very vulnerable developing countries are dependent heavily dependent on fossil fuels, and some of them are heavily dependent on um, on coal uh, or even on diesel. So we need to make sure that the alternatives for them to move from that dependence to cleaner sources of energy are there. Uh, we, the, the, the international community, we cannot just tell them, you know, you have to go away from fossil fuels without providing some kind of solution to their situation. There's a lot to unpack there, and I want to come back to a number of your points, um, uh, especially related to, to developing countries and finance. But, but let me just point out first and, and, and ask you to comment on the news yesterday that uh, Xi Jinping pledged uh, the United Nations that China will enhance its NDP, um, work to achieve, uh, work to peak its emissions before 2030, and I think um, probably mo most notably in, in, the, the, um, in his pledges to achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Um, tell me, you know, tell me how significant you think this is and, and uh, you know, the, well, how significant is China's, is China's pledge? Well, um, I, I, I really believe this is very significant and I, I, I really welcome this, um, this um, a announcement from China. I think it is significant for many reasons. One, for what, what really uh, uh, means for a country of the size of China and in the situation of China uh, to come forward with this, this level of ambitions. Um, uh, I mean, if we would uh, look at uh, other uh, emerging countries, if we could have this, this level of uh, ambition also on their side, or even some developed countries, you know, if they, if, if, if they would also show this, this level of ambition, it would be really very good. So at the moment, we uh, really need this kind of leadership. So I think uh, the, the signal that, um, that China is giving in providing this leadership is very, very important. Second, uh, of course, in terms of the numbers, it does imply an increase in ambition from what China had put on the table before. And um, uh, that is really the kind of signals that we need to get from Everybody, basically. Um, at I mean, this I moment, moment, pardon me. Please. Just to you know, I mean, the Climate Action Tracker, very well respected uh, organization that gauge con gauges countries' pledges, had rated China's initial pledges as highly insufficient. So there is a lot of room for improvement there, you know, in, in the world's now largest emitter. I mean, of course, there is, we're still not there. We're still not where we, where we need to be. But the, the change is significant. And I think this is what we require at this time. We need to see this kind of leadership at the political level that will then really drive the transformational changes in all sectors of the economy. And 
Madam Secretary, I mean, you mentioned China's leadership, which obviously raises the question of the absence of the United States leadership right now. Um, you know, to your, to your mind, how much of the struggle to, to encourage countries to raise ambition has, how much of, of that has been, um, you know, made more difficult by the absence of pressure from the United States under the Obama administration you know, the, the United States was working with countries on their N NDCs, was sort of leading this, this thought around peer pressure, uh, <laughs> building, building ambition up. Um, that's gone away. Has, how much of a hole has that left? Well, um, actually, we, we do need this leadership. You say, you say peer pressure, I, I, would, I would also put it as, as leadership, you know? When you are leading, then you, you, you are also uh, encouraging others to, to follow suit. Um, it, we really need, need that because um, the, the process uh, and uh, the, the international climate regime is, is clearly reflects clearly what the individual members of that international community do. So there's not, it's not that it's separated, you know, that, that there is uh, somebody that will say, okay, this is what needs to be done. And then uh, uh, the countries will follow. It's actually the countries themselves that need to get together in order to go towards these very uh, ambitious goals. And why are our countries doing that? They are doing it because of the, their, their self-interest, because of the conviction that this is something good for their uh, populations and when we are seeing that uh, you know as I was mentioning the examples of uh, devastation and uh, uh, incredible cost in the US uh, this becomes uh, very evident so we do need we do need this uh, we welcome also very much the fact that the uh, European Union has been working hard with the new uh, leadership in order to come forward with more ambitious uh, commitments uh, we certainly hope that they will be able to present a revised uh, NDC by the end of the year as well. That's, that leadership is really badly needed. I, I would also encourage people to follow the directions that they received at the beginning of the uh, opening of the discussion and, and please start sending your questions. We'll, we'll open it up in, in uh, about 10, 15 minutes. Um, Madam Secretary, I, I don't know if you read the New York Times today, but my, my wonderful, uh, brilliant colleagues, um, Brad Plumer and uh, John Branch did a piece um, getting at the, the sweep of climate disruption. One really interesting aspect that I thought they raised was that, um, was the number of disasters that are now hitting the developed world, um, as you said in your in your comments, you know we this we, we have been thinking about this in terms of only hitting um, the poorest and most vulnerable countries, um, low lying nations, um, um, and, and and now we're seeing wildfires raging through the West and the United States, um, hurricanes ravaging countries, floods, ravaging wealthy nations. Um, do you think that is going to make countries and their governments more or less likely to help developing countries deal with, with their challenges? Um, do you see this as eye-opening for the developed world or will this you know, worrisomely be a, a, a moment when countries say, you know, we are going to be facing billions of dollars of new challenges, trillions of dollars at home, and we need to focus on ourselves. Well, um, you know, I think that there is uh, so much evidence um, uh, currently about uh, the, the fact that uh, supporting other countries in addressing these uh, global challenges is actually, yes, of course, a sign of solidarity, but it's also uh, in the self-interest of, of, uh, of the richer countries. 
Uh, a more prosperous world is a more stable world. A more prosperous world a more, is, a, is a, a, a more peaceful world. Take the example of uh, COVID, of the pandemic. Um, there is no way that uh, anybody can address such a global threat um, in isolation. There is no, no possibility. We are so interconnected. The world has become small. We are interconnected, interrelated. Our, the, 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 um, uh, our everyday life really has an incredible amount of uh, relations with what is happening elsewhere in the world. And this is, I, I would say, the, the big, big difference between the global crisis of today and global, global crisis before, like uh, Second World War, let's say, the post-war period, right? Yes, it's a, it was a global crisis, but it hit the uh, um, different countries in a different way and the responses were also very, very different. So in today's world, I think there is sufficient evidence that this is just not going to work and that it is in the uh, best interest of, of each and every one of us as countries or as individuals to really look for the better situation of our neighbors, wherever we are. You, you called just now for phasing out coal as soon as possible. Um, Antonio Guterres has called for an end to new coal plants after 2020. Do you agree with, with that? Do you support that target year? Well, um, yes. I mean, if we could say yesterday, you know, we, we, would, we would go uh, uh, that way. I think it has to be done really uh, as soon as possible. And for that, I think the, the key is the, this, the point I was making, which is um, while we are uh, asking uh, for those measures to be taken, we need to be able also to provide the alternatives. Okay, don't, don't invest in new, new coal-fired power plants. Yes, absolutely. I, 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 I believe that, you know, going towards a recovery with coal is not really a recovery. It's really, can we, can we call that a recovery if we are, you know, if we, if we understand a recovery as something better? Are we really going into a, a, a better scenario? Not, not really. So um, we need to do that, but we need to concentrate a lot on, okay, what are the solutions? What are the remedies? And how far are we right now from this $100 billion goal uh, in, in public and private funding that countries laid out ahead of the Paris Agreement? Well, uh, we, we don't have the, the figures uh, yet. There are quite a, a few groups that are working on this. I really hope and expect that we, we should be getting uh, uh, at least hopefully very, very close. Of course, the fact that we will not have a, um, a conference, an in-person conference this year, when we have the, also the deadline for the mobilization of the 100 billion, uh, should not mean that this, uh, that this a particular commitment uh, should be overseen. So we are, um, yes, uh, working and following closely with those who are uh, working on that particular piece. Yeah. Um, you know, before I, I open this to, to, to questions, I mean, we can't uh, ignore the, the biggest elephant in the room. Um, you know, the United States election is around the corner. If President Trump wins the second term and U.S. withdrawal becomes official from the Paris Agreement, what will your message to the world be? Well, um, the, the, um, the U.S. leaving the Paris Agreement will be uh, concrete and official, will become official on the 4th of November. And um, uh, so, my message already already now is that uh, you know we I really hope and I will uh, do all I can in order to try to 
get uh, the U.S., who is a really an important partner uh, in our process, but globally, and a, a very, very important player to rejoin uh, the Paris Agreement. I have to say, though, I, I expect and I hope that we will still see active participation by the U.S. Uh, because the U.S. will remain a party to the convention, uh, mm -hmm. the Framework Convention on Climate Change. So I, uh, I hope that this, is, this uh, is an avenue where we can continue to work uh, with the U.S. Uh, on these issues. And by the same token, I mean, if we have a, if uh, Vice President, former Vice President Joe Biden, his Democratic contender, wins the election, he has pledged to bring the United States back into the Paris Agreement. Um, but what do you think countries will need to see from the U.S. at that point beyond a declaration of we're back? I mean, we, we heard that when, uh, when the Obama administration came in after the United States uh, uh, removed itself from the Kyoto Protocol. Um, so what, you know, what, what else do you think that countries will need to see from the United States and, and how do you see this issue of trust being addressed? Well, I think um, we, the, the international community, countries will be really looking forward to see very uh, con concise and very concrete, ambitious national uh, climate plans, national goals, like, um, you know, what we are expecting from everyone uh, by the end uh, of this year. I think this is something that will be really uh, critical and crucial. I have to say that there is also a lot of uh, interest in the process in following on what so many cities, um, uh, state level governments are, are doing in order to address climate change. So I think that uh, what, what will be needed is really very clear uh, signals, very clear plans on where the US would want to go. Clear plans. Um, you know, we have such a large number of questions. I'm just going to start diving into some of these a little early and, and sort of weave, uh, <laughs> weave some of mine uh, in, into these. Um, we have a, a question on, on multilateral engagement. Um, a few days ago, one of the United States negotiators from the Paris Agreement, Sue Piaz, uh, talked about how difficult it is to promote international cooperation and accountability and as well as enforcement of multilateral agreements. Um, you talked about the distinct lack of climate plans submitted by nations following the, the, the you know, ahead of, of COP26 um, and, and the, the concerns about the United States pulling out, weakening the agreement as a whole. How do we move forward from this? Well, um, you know, I, I, in diplomacy, of course, the, the most important tool is dialogue and mutual understanding. And so uh, I think um, the, the, the task here is to continue to promote uh, these um, strong dialogues, good exchanges, well-informed exchanges on what is really uh, what is behind, what are the, the, what is the extent of the risks, what are we looking at, how, what are the different realities that need to be addressed. Uh, and uh, yes, it is true in our process, of course, it's not uh, the, the main uh, uh, governing body is a conference of the parties and the conference of the parties is uh, 197 countries, which each one has a different, uh, a different reality. So it is this, um, a, you know, this sense of common purpose, that common purpose is, uh, however, not in the interest of the other. It is in my own interest, but if that happens to be the interest of each of and every one of those 197, then I think we is, is the way to move forward. Of course, it means 
that uh, we need to be ready to uh, accept and to understand that not what will be done is not only following my specific reality and my specific priorities. However, I think the Paris Agreement um, provides a very unique and very a, a very good framework in it, that it, it allows countries to put forward their own plans. And at the same time, it defines very clearly what are the goals, the collective goals that need to be achieved. So um, I think it's a, it's a combination where we, yes, of course, it has to be based on trust. It has to be based on the trust that everyone is going to be uh, trying to do the best uh, each country can. Uh, but uh, at the end, it is based really in the self-interest of each and every one of the members. You know, just going back to the, to the NDCs and the raising ambition, I mean, I think one of the challenges of the original set of NDCs was um, part of the, the beauty of it, right? That countries could put forward their own domestic goals, um, but it was really very hard to uh, gauge, to compare them to one another, to, uh, to understand, um, you know, who is being more ambitious and less ambitious. There was no common baseline. Um, it, uh, you know, it, it was, it, it included, um, for deforestation goals and and carbon emission reductions and adaptation, well, we can talk about adaptation separately. But you know, going forward, how you know does the UNFCCC have a plan? Are countries willing to um, to set a baseline to set some kind of standard so that the public can really understand who's proposing ambition and who is not? And who's greenwashing? Well, um, actually, you know, since uh, since Paris, a lot of the work uh, in the in the technical work in the negotiations has been really about how to be able to give transparency and monitor and have a good monitoring system of the progress that we will be making. So a lot of the work has been has been about. You know what kind of information do the countries need to provide to the to the secretariat on their plans? How how are is that information going to be provided? What, uh, in in what type of of, of, of formats? Um, and in order to be able to, as you say, have a better capacity to compare uh, one against the other. At the same time, it is a very complex, complex exercise because, uh, you know, the differences in the realities that we have in those 197 countries, uh, parties, um, it, it, it by itself, almost by definition, uh, is, makes it uh, really very challenging. But this is precisely what we have been uh, trying to put together under what we now call uh, uh, the Katowice uh, package, which are the, you know, the, the rule book or the guiding, um, uh, uh, the guidelines for implementation of the Paris Agreement. And, and let's turn to adaptation a moment, which I know, you know, often gets short shrift in these discussions. Um, do you expect countries to start raising ambition with respect to adaptation? What, and what, what would you, what it was important to see in, in countries' adaptation plans? Well, I do expect to see an increase of, uh, of, of uh, ambition on adap adaptation because um, as we were saying, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the impacts that we are seeing throughout the world, not only in the, in the island states and not only in the least developed countries, uh, is really enormous. Uh -oh. The costs that this uh, has uh, uh, entailed, uh, economic, but also in terms of loss of biodiversity, etc., are just immense. So I do, I do hope, I do hope that we can uh, see 
better adaptation, uh, much more adaptation measures, and that that becomes also uh, part of actually, you know, the uh, overall uh, uh, development uh, plans uh, everywhere um, because uh, of what we now know. These are not going to be seasonal events. These are not going to be once in a decade event. We know that it is going to be much more frequent and it is going to be uh, it to hit harder. So uh, at the same time, we have developed in a lot of experience around the world on what can work. And uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, I, I am really a, a big, big, big supporter of the nature-based solutions that are possible in a, most of the, of the countries and that are actually um, frequently not that costly uh, but can can uh, allow us to protect lives and uh, nature uh, and also many ecosystems. I, I wonder if you could talk a little more about your vision for how you hope countries build back post COVID. And I, I will wrap into this a question from uh, a viewer who is who writes. Do you fear that post COVID many industrial nations will put climate conscious policies at the back burner? for an economic resurgence? If so, how do you convince nations to stop short-term economic redevelopment in exchange for a long-term goal if many democratic nations, uh, if in many democratic nations, the short-term economy is a big voting issue? Yeah, well, I think, um, first of all, yes, this is very challenging. We are, uh, not our uh, main um, partners in the countries are the ministries of environment. And as we know, ministries of environment are not the ones that have the direct responsibility of putting together the uh, investment plans for governments or the, the, the general uh, planning for development in, in the governments. They, participate in many instances, uh, in, in some they, they actually don't participate that much. I, I have seen um, a, a, an interesting um, trend uh, that uh, has to do with some countries having put together some structures in order to uh, mainstream not only climate change in many cases, but also uh, the sustainable development goals into their development planning. And I think that is something very, very valuable. These are the kind of examples that um, is very important to share with other, with other entities. So uh, one of the, of, of, of the challenges that we have is really to try to get, uh, try to reach, try to be able to address uh, those entities responsible for putting together these, uh, these plans. In this case, the, you know, the COVID uh, recovery plans. Um, on, on, the, uh, on the other hand, it's also about uh, telling the stories that um, climate and growth, climate and recovery are not mutually exclusive that the two aspects can and should be addressed simultaneously. So if you are putting together a recovery package, let's say, to address unemployment, and then in that recovery package, you are, you are contemplating infrastructure development. Right. Okay, then it, is, it makes sense to make sure that that infrastructure is designed in a way that allows to build resilience, that that infrastructure is also designed in a way that um, uses the best possible materials, uh, the least uh, carbon intensive materials. So I think this is really the, the challenge that we, that we have. But fortunately, there are a lot of very successful stories that, and that is what we need to replicate and give more visibility. 
we have obviously a large university audience and, and a number of questions about uh, research and, and engagement with universities. Um, uh, one person asks, you know, you mentioned working with researchers in universities like University of Pennsylvania. Does the UNFCCC have formal collaboration opportunities with researchers or grants for research and training? What role does capacity building play in your view for raising ambition? Well, we have in, in our uh, process, we have a, a group of constituencies of observers. And, and one group of those observers is the is a RINGO, which are research uh, institutions, research and academic institutions. Uh, so they come and participate and they also provide uh, inputs in many, on, on many of the issues that are discussed during, uh, uh, in the process, for instance, on the more technical things. Um, uh, we issue open calls and uh, ask for contributions also from entities uh, beyond the parties. That includes um, a, a, a research centers and also academic institutions. So in order to have, uh, you know, as much as possible, the best knowledge available uh, to try to put together the framework that will govern the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So we have that. Having said that, I, I would say that there is really a lot of uh, room for further collaboration. Um, capacity building is, um, besides finance, really the most important uh, need in developing countries. Developing countries, very frequently, we find that they are willing to uh, commit, willing to dedicate uh, resources, but they don't have the, 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 you know, the human resources to do that. They don't have, of course, uh, either uh, in, in many, many cases, most cases, the technologies or the finance. But, you know, not even having, um, a, a being able to put together a team to do this. Uh, take, the, take the example of the enhanced transparency framework. So the enhanced transparency framework will in, involve or will imply that countries will need to provide very detailed um, technical information in order for, for us, as you, as you mentioned before, to be able to have a good monitoring system of how we are making progress. But for an island country to put in place such capacity is really a huge challenge. Yeah. So it is, it is, uh, it is a, a, a big area uh, that we, we need to uh, continue expanding. Now, especially now, that when we are coming into the phase of full implementation of the Paris Agreement. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, bring up the, the student uh, movement and youth movements uh, that pre-COVID um, were just an enormous part of the of the landscape of discussion around climate change. Um, can you, you know, obviously the student strikes and the youth movements played an enormous role in raising awareness around climate change. What role, if any, do you think it's had in actually pushing countries to raise ambition? Well, I think it has had really a very, very important, uh, important uh, effect. If you, if you uh, take the example of Europe, where we are located, we are in Bonn, Germany, and you look at the results of uh, elections in the, last, um, uh, in the last two years, you know, it really shows very clearly how much the issue of, sus of sustainability has uh, risen in the, uh, at the center of uh, decision-making uh, in the general population. I think it has really made a big difference, but this is only one, one thing. There is also, you know, uh, um, some of the, of the private companies that have been uh, now willing to engage into taking up some commitments um, we have um, a, a campaign uh, that is called Race to Zero, which means race to, to net zero carbon. 
Um, and, and if you look at the list of, uh, of uh, private companies that have joined that uh, campaign, uh, it really is surprising. And I think it reflects how conscious they have become that the public is, going, is, is changing already their consumption patterns and their preferences. And, and therefore that has really a very, very important impact. Um, do you support the, uh, the um, student movement to ban fossil fuel divestment from their universities? Sorry, I, uh, the, the sound was not... Sure, student, student, there, there are a number of student movements at universities across the country to demand fossil fuel divestment from, from universities. Do you support that movement? Well, I think it is something, this is, this is um, uh, where we need to go. Uh, you know, I think this is, this is very important. But as I was saying before, uh, what, we, what we need to uh, be very conscious is that this energy transition needs to be a just transition, needs to take people uh, with, with it. So yes, yes, I think, uh, you know, I mean, we have a very con concrete example, the subsidies for fossil fuels, which have, we have quite a number of very important and high level decisions uh, being taken in the past to end subsidies uh, for fossil fuels and, and still they, they have not been ended uh, everywhere in the world. In some countries they have, but in others they have not. So um, uh, that means that there is public money still going to uh, uh, these uh, sources of energy that are part of uh, what is causing the problem. So I think, yes, that, that is a very important part. But we need to also look at how are the needs, the energy needs be going to be uh, uh, addressed in the absence of uh, fossil fuels. And you mentioned businesses, uh, you know, taking, taking action. Talk about the role of city, other states, other non-state non climate activity. Um, um, what, you know, what is the role of these subnational actors going to be at COP26? Um, are they moving, you know, particularly in the case of the US, do you see them moving faster than the federal government at this point? Um, and how, how will the UNFCCC incorporate their plans into global discussions and, and uh, you know, and ambition? Well, we have um, a permanent um, a, a very, very close uh, working relationship with uh, two entities that are bringing cities together in order to uh, commit to climate change and put in place uh, climate uh, action plans. Uh, one of them is uh, ICLE, the other one is C40, and uh, both of them have been, you know, their membership has been growing exponentially, which is really very, very good news. Uh, we uh, um, collaborate with them. Uh, ICLE is, is based also, the, the venue of ICLE is also Bonn, so, uh, and actually, the mayor of Bonn is the, is, is the president of ICLE at the, at the moment. So uh, we do engage uh, with them a lot. In, in many ways, you know, when I talk to them, I say uh, climate change uh, is, is going to be won uh, in cities. Why? Because cities account for 70% of the uh, global emissions. So it is absolutely necessary that we have the commitment of the cities. Depending on the countries, the uh, governance uh, um, models are different. In many places, uh, cities have independent powers and competence to uh, deal with some aspects that have a very uh, direct uh, effect on, on, uh, on climate and in general towards sustainability. In others, uh, things are, are uh, more uh, directed from the, cent the central government. But um, the bottom line is that we really need everyone on board. 
And uh, fortunately, what we are seeing, including in the US, is that cities are increasingly uh, willing to commit. Why? Because it's in their own interest. We look at what is happening in California, so it's only natural that uh, cities there will engage in ambitious climate uh, plans. I think that, that dovetails nicely into, into a great closing question from, from one of the viewers here who, who asks, in addition to the natural sea process, if you had a wish list for priorities in the next five years to, still, to stay well below two degrees, what would be at the top of your wish list? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a very that's a very uh, difficult question because, as I said, you know, this is a, a this agenda is kind of a puzzle that needs a lot of pieces to fit together. Otherwise, it will not it will not work. But um, okay, if we were to enumerate priorities, I would say yes. We need the plans. We need the NDCs. We need the commitments, NDCs with clear commitments and higher ambition. And we need uh, um, the uh, support, uh, we need the finance. We need the finance to be able to make that, those plans um, a reality. These, um, these events between the pandemic and everything else happening in the world are, are so difficult. Uh, Secretary Spinoza, we're so grateful you were able to join us today. Can I ask you to leave us with um, what gives you hope or reason for optimism on climate change right now? Well, um, as I was uh, as I was mentioning in my in my introductory remarks, I think uh, I'm an optimist, and I think we cannot lose hope. And uh, yes, it's my job, right? I I need to to give a sign of of optimism. But the truth is that really, if we look at what humanity has been able to achieve, how humanity has been able to overcome some of the very, very difficult uh, challenges, uh, we need to, be, to have faith, to trust in genuity of the human uh, species and our willingness to move forward. What gives me hope also? The youth. The people that are going on the streets. The people that are going to your university and engaging in this kind of conversation. Thank you so much again for all of your time today and thank you to the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you so much, Executive Secretary Espinoza, for those insights. And thank you, Lisa, for moderating, moderating an exceptional conversation. Again, thank you to our audience for joining us here today and asking very thoughtful questions. These are such critical issues to our national and global security and our future. And it's an honor to have you discussing them here at Perry World House. We're thrilled that this event can be part of both our Global Shifts Colloquium and Penn Climate Week. There are plenty more events on climate change organized by students and faculty from all over the university that you can tune into for the rest of the week. Links to register for those events are in the chat and a recording of this broadcast will be available on the Perry World House YouTube channel. And just around the corner, October 5th through 7th will be our Global Order Colloquium. So stay tuned for more details on our next big event. Thank you very much.